Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, let me start by thanking Jose Antonio de la Peña, Victor Perez Abreu, and Francisco Gonzalez for helping me to put together this lecture. Thank you very much. For ETAM and for the math department, it is an honor and a great pleasure to have here the director of the Institut Henri Poincaré, who is a professor at the Université of Lyon and has received the 2010 Fields Medal. He will be talking about the living art of mathematics, and uh, you have already welcomed, but you can do it again. Welcome Cedric Villani, please. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure, it's great joy to lecture in front of such a big crowd, so enthusiastic as you are. Uh, as I am just watching this, I realize maybe there, there might be some distortion in the images we'll see when it arises. I also noticed that I made the first mistake since it is not 14 but 15 December. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about uh, art of mathematics and in the talk I will mix several stories together. My personal story and evolution as a mathematician and the problems I worked with, but also the story of uh, some mathematical adventures, but also the story of uh, how we work as mathematicians. Let's see if I can change the... Then comes Euclid. Euclid is the symbol of the power of the written transmission, the book, and all that this can do to disseminate knowledge and to preserve it. It is said that the book of Euclid was the most edited non-religious treatise in all history. And, of course, uh, recently the book of Euclid was still used as part of the curricula. There is no other science in which uh, things remain true as long. Mathematics, something that you prove remains true for thousands of years. In all other fields, you have to change much more frequently. Next in line is Archimedes. Archimedes would be symbol of the mathematical genius, the one who sees better and further than the other ones. He's the one uh, whose face is on the Fields Medal. And last in line, Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes could be symbol of the ability of mathematics to change our view of the world and to go and learn things about our world that our common sense and intuition is not sufficient to get. Here is the most famous of Eratosthenes' achievements. Eratosthenes was both geographer and mathematician, and in a famous um, calculation, he used some uh, particularity of some well. There was the a well in Sien such that the sun would shine exactly at the vertical a certain day in the year. He used this particularity and some clever mathematics, clever but not difficult, to uh, measure the Earth. And he obtained a measurement which was about correct up to maybe 2% of error. And it's remarkable to think that uh, 2,000 years ago and more, people, at least the Greek mathematicians, they knew the size of the Earth with great accuracy. Uh, some example, as I said, of the fact that mathematics change, changes the vision that you have of the world. I 
remember reading about this achievement of Eratosthenes when I was a kid in one of these books of uh, science explained to kids, uh, and uh, it remained a vivid memory. What you read as a kid has a lot of influence on you because it is engraved very hard in your brain, sometimes without you noticing. And it is very often that people are influenced all their life by things that they read when they are young. As a famous example, the great mathematician Alan Turing, all his life was influenced by a book that he read when he was 10 years old. And there are a number of other examples. When I was 10 years, I'm not sure what I read, but I remember I was watching this movie, Donald in Math Magic Land. I found it was really super. Well, I tell you, it is not deep mathematics, but it can make a big impression on uh, kids. In Donald in Math Magic Land, it was uh, insisting on uh, mathematics, especially in relation with the arts, with two major problems. How to construct the musical scale, a problem which is, uh, whose solution is attributed to Pythagoras in its first version. You know, because the various frequencies of the strings on the guitar or whatever, you would like them to be uh, uh, definite fractions, and you ask which fraction should it be, etc. And there are some subtleties. And the other was the golden ratio, and its would be appearance in many works of art. I found this fascinating, and uh, later I would understand that these uh, two problems, people talk about them a bit too much, in the case of golden ratio, far too much, and that golden ratio certainly does not deserve to be so much uh, popular, even though it is important. But it was uh, uh, very well done in terms of pedagogy because it was hooking kids with some things that are easy to relate with, like uh, music or visual arts. Actually, nowadays, the theme of the interface between mathematics and art is extremely popular, and you find even journals devoted to this. And uh, this, of course, is an interesting and important topic. I'll come back to it later at the end of the talk. But uh, right now, I will emphasize on the fact that mathematics in itself is some kind of art, and that there is output from mathematics which very much relates to artistic notions, even though we would not think of it naturally as some piece of art. And first, to begin with, let us recall that art in the first place is about representing the world or giving a certain interpretation, a representation of things in the world. And it is remarkable that many objects of nature can be represented with uh, basic concepts of mathematics and with uh, useful, deep concepts of mathematics, sometimes with very simple geometrical shapes. Also that mathematics, and here we are back to the Pythagoras idea, allows you to represent any kinds of signal, any kind of signal, be it, for instance, a song here, in terms of numbers, in terms of functions. And uh, this is extremely powerful, it gives some kind of universal representation of things around us. Universal in the sense that you can convert some reality into some collections of objects which eventually boil down to numbers and relations between numbers, but then which we may think of as logical objects, forgetting about the numbers behind. Let us also recall that many of the laws governing nature can be expressed in mathematical terms. This 
was uh, the idea conveyed in this uh, cartoon, which I took from some comic blog, whose title was How Scientists See the World. <laughs> and of course, in this picture, the intention is clear. Whatever the scene, however natural it is, and so on, you may find behind it lots of mathematical equations, which are like abstract representations. The first comment is that if you really want to draw the list, of course, there are many, many more equations than there are in this. You would need probably a full book like this to write them. The second comment is that a remarkable feature of nature around us is that in many cases we can isolate some of these features or some of these phenomena or some of these equations and study them, forgetting for a while about the rest, and then get some understanding by combining the knowledge which we gain from these various parts. This is a remarkable thing about the nature of the world allowing us to study, studying it in depth. Let us then note that mathematics is not only useful to analyze the world, but also to make it, to do it. And uh, as an example, here is this building, kind of uh, weird building, the Fondation Louis Vuitton, which was inaugurated in Paris last year. It was a big international buzz. And uh, it was made by famous architect Van Gerich. But uh, this building does not seem to be mathematical in uh, any way, because you cannot see any symmetry, for sure no golden ratio, and so on. <laughs> However, it uh, relies deeply on mathematics, because with such an uh, extraordinary building, if you just build it like you trying this and that, you are sure that it will collapse. You need a prior building to entirely build it in the digital world, to compute the stresses and the force and make sure that it really stands. And uh, a couple of decades ago, it would have been impossible to make this building because the software aiding the architects was not up to, uh, the, up to the task. It uh, needed to be perfected. Of course, the software does not make everything. There were also a certain number of patents on uh, certain devices used to construct the foundation. But it needed also the computing power and the mathematical equations, modeling and reproducing this reality before it even exists. And uh, also in this uh, direction, but remaining in the virtual world, here is an image from one of the arguably most mathematical movies ever made. This is gravity, and uh, one of the remarkable things about gravity is that essentially it is all done virtually. The only thing which is true in the movie are the faces of the actors, almost. <laughs> All the rest is computed, computed by means of algorithms and uh, mathematics. And again, it needed several years of development of the uh, digital technology before it was possible to produce this movie. So again, an example of the power of mathematics. Also illustrating the fact that mathematics has some poetic value poetic in the etymological sense, which is about creating some kind of new world, inspired from the world that we are used to, but different in certain respects. In this case, the main difference is that gravity was removed. And you see, once you create the mathematical world, you may change the laws of nature. And this is more and more used in the uh, animated industry. So, this illustrates the ability of nature to create this world kind of intermediate between our world and a completely different world, somewhat in between. And uh, that, as uh, 
saying that mathematics is the poetry of sciences. It was the title of a lecture which I gave some time ago in Belgium. Mathematics and poetry can be actually compared in several respects. The first is this creation uh, goal of mathematics and poetry. The second is the extreme importance of constraint in both arts, if I may say, 